Hello, this is Mayor Chris Ballwage, and welcome to another edition of Our City. On Monday, October 24th, the 15th annual Rotary Club Taste of Elizabeth will be held at the Renaissance Hotel on Route 1. It will feature over 50 multicultural Elizabeth restaurants. And for tickets or any information, you can contact our social media pages and we will be able to provide you with follow-up information. But please join us on Monday, October 24th. I believe it's between 5.30 and 8 p.m. And on Thursday, October 27th, I'll cut the ribbon for the new Rancho Mateo location on the corner of Julian Place and Morris Avenue, right near the Elizabeth train station. It looks to be a great restaurant. The city of Elizabeth and the County of Union still have plenty of vaccines and plenty of availability. You can reach us through ucnjvaccine.org, the city of Elizabeth website, elizabethnj.org, or any of our social media sites for any additional information. If you have any questions, you can call our public information office at 908-820-4124. And for this evening's show, I am pleased to be joined by the senator from the 20th district, of which Elizabeth is a member of, Senator Joseph Krein. Senator, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. So listen, Senator, tell us about yourself. You've had a long and storied career in politics. Uh, where do you want to start, from like the very beginning? Well, storied is a word. <laughs> uh, sure, we've all got stories. Thanks. I've, I've had the good fortune of being the municipal chair of the Town of Union. I've had the opportunity to serve the residents of the 20th District in the State Assembly, along with the privilege of being the State Democratic Chairman. And uh, also had the privilege of serving the County of Union as both an undersheriff and then again as a sheriff when we lost Ralph Froelich. And obviously now I have the honor of being the senator in the 20th District, and it's something I, I truly cherish. <coughs> so in the 20th District, Joe, tell us the towns that are made up, because we just had a redistricting. Did our towns change in any way? Well, Chris, you and I, uh, in, from the Township of Union, and the city of Elizabeth stay in the 20th district, which as you know, um, became became the 20th district in 2001. Uh, we also retain the borough of Roselle. The change for the 20th district in next year's election cycle is, is that the city of Hillside will no longer be a part of it. However, the borough of Kenilworth will be. Uh, it retains frankly the same configuration that it had from 2001 to 2011. Um, so basically, we go back a little bit, but for the majority of the district, we remain pretty consistent. And, and Senator, before before you and I were involved, or maybe, I mean, Carteret was in our district, right? I, Lyndon Carteret. Tell us about, you've been involved in the redistricting process. It's a lot of behind the books, so to say, right? right. Behind the books is certainly a way to put it. It's uh, an intense you know, it's something I tell people, if you're truly interested in politics, you should do once and never again. It's very intense. There's winners and losers, which is always a difficult thing. Um, you mentioned Elizabeth, right? Going legendary folks from Carteret, right? Uh, folks with uh, great reputations. Uh, Union, for example, went all the way to Cedar Grove in, in their last district before we went out. Kevin O'Toole was the, uh, was the senator for the for Union for quite a while, um, or assembly member, excuse me. And um, those, one of the things I like about our district is that we're compact, right? We, we share each other's cultures, we know each other, we know what's going on in the communities around us. You know, you get some members in, in different parts of New Jersey, which we don't appreciate here, um, given the amount of folks that live here that represent 40, 50 different towns. Uh, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I have, uh, you know, I'm able to work with four great communities, four great leaders, and have and have that opportunity to find and, and find common ground and look for things that can really help. So, Senator, you mentioned about doing things once. Uh, you've worked with a lot of young people. What would you tell them to do if they wanted to get involved in politics? Hmm. Um, you know, what I when I talk to young people today, and it's a little bit different than 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I'd say follow your passion, get involved in student government, get involved early those sort of things. But when I talk to people, to young people today, I talk to them a little bit differently. I, I, I speak to them and I generally try to do it over coffee. And I tell them less, less text, more verbal. Um, you and I can share a story. We were with a, a mutual friend one day when he looked at us and said, I like policy, you guys like people. 
And I remember that because we both enjoy the conversations and the interaction with the people we're privileged enough to represent and to understand their hopes and dreams. I think young people today, in particular, based on the changes in the way we communicate, um, don't have that inherent skill set to go out and ask folks how they're doing, like you opened up this conversation. Um, I think they've got to become, if you really want to be involved in politics, my first piece of advice for a young person is learn to listen. My second is, is learn not to speak until someone has finished their thought. And my third is to be verbal and understand folks. And if you can do that, you'll be, I think you'll be, a, you'll be a, a great leader and a great public servant. Senator, you raise a really good point. I mean, spending more and more time on texting and social media sites without getting out and meeting the guy next door flipping the hamburgers in the backyard is a real struggle for people who want to eventually get elected. But then again, campaigns are focused on getting elected just through social media. Right. It's about what ad you can produce, um, what type of what type of uh you know, message you can send in a quick in a quick time frame, but that's not going to tell you that the guy. To your point about flipping the burgers, right? It's not going to tell you that the guy next door needs some help with his property taxes, or that his kid is struggling in college, or all those sort of things that that you and I both know happen in, in families each and every day. And I think that you've got to be able to not only put yourself in a position to listen, but you've also got to encourage people to talk to you. We're all a little bit, I think, post COVID just a little bit more defensive and a little bit more quiet and a little bit more inherent. You, as a, as a national leader, in my view, in terms of COVID response, um, understand this probably better than I ever will, that people are, general, are, we're different now and we're more reserved and we're certainly a little more judgmental, I think, overall. Social media allows us to define that, but it doesn't allow us to know each other. And campaigns truly, I believe, at the end of the day are about knowing the folks that you want to have the opportunity to represent and the privilege to do so. So I think it's a real struggle, and I think it's a struggle for a big, a greater issue than just you and I or the 20th district. But inherently, in our own ways, I, I think you you not only knock on a door and say hello, but you say hello when you're walking and you ask folks how they're doing. And people generally, if you work it and give them a, a feeling that you have not only just an empathy but a responsibility and a desire to understand where they are at, that they'll tell you. And I really believe that to be critically important to being part of an effective leader in this day and age. We need to get back to more of that, Senator. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you um, got to work the tables at the dance and you got to work the, you know, work the room where you walk in and you got to just uh, not only just listen, but follow up and, and hopefully folks uh, give you an ear. And, and if you can do that, you're doing OK. Senator, you've been active in Trenton, not only helping the city of Elizabeth, but the state as a whole. And one of the bills that you were uh, the prime sponsor on is the temporary workers bill. And how is that proceeding through the legislature? And tell our viewers exactly what that will do for uh, some temporary workers. Okay. Oh, thanks for asking about it. It's a bill that uh, it provides worker protections for those folks that are employed in temp agencies. It's primarily driven towards low wage, low income workers, primarily in the industrial sector. So we're talking about warehouse workers here, folks like that. Um, and as you know, Mayor, the explosion, and we all order things off the phone now. And somebody's making that happen. And these are the folks that actually are making that happen. Um, in many cases, we define, and I think if you're of a certain age, you have this impression of a temporary worker as somebody who fills in on maternity leave or the accountant at tax time. Uh, that's not what this bill is, not in the least. This bill is about folks that work for a very long, extended period of time in the industrial sector, like warehousing, for years and years and years in many cases that aren't being paid minimum wage that have to frankly provide uh, pay for their own, pay for transportation that can only be supplied by temporary worker agencies, by temp agencies that often get charged twice for things and don't get their proper pay and often get paid less than minimum wage. So these are workers and there's 127,000 of them across the state of New Jersey. I know you have taken a leadership fight and for example, in, in worker safety rights, you and I just went through a thing in, in Newark airport where uh, you were victorious with your leadership. No, 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 Senator. If you didn't weigh in on that, I'm not so sure we would have won. You, oh, I, you... I, I, I defer. But that oh. said, yeah, but we cared about the people who were doing the work, right? That's what it's about. And this bill is about folks that do the work, that their worker protect, their worker safety is is there because uh, there are numerous, numerous accounts. For example, we had three deaths over the summer in different warehouses around the state. 
in Carteret, which you mentioned earlier in the town, uh, Robbinsville and Monroe. And then of course, these folks take mandatory or have to take mandatory rides, mandatory transportation. On September 2nd, we had four, four workers killed on the Palisades Parkway in Bergen County with an unsafe van provided by a temp worker agency. So the bill is about providing worker safety, workers' rights. Um, it's been a long and arduous fight to get this bill passed. We just went through a bump last week where we thought we would have those, those votes. Um, we'll continue to fight for it. We're dealing with, a, a, right now, the bill has passed both houses. The governor has conditionally vetoed it. He's added funding and actually helped make the bill a little bit stronger. We're looking for 21 votes in the New Jersey State Senate because you need one more than half uh, to get it passed. And right now we don't have them, but we're going to continue to search to do so. So so the governor's veto hurt the bill in a way on some of the people who voted for it originally? In my view, the bill, in my view, the governor's veto actually helped. It added some funding for enforcement because, as you know, um, the enforcement sometimes can be uh, a little less than strenuous. Um, so we were pleased about that. He added some definitions that I thought helped clarity of the bill. Um, and one of the things we wanted, for example, Mayor, was if you're a power temp, and we call them, excuse me, permit temps. So the idea is they're really permanent temporary employees. But if you're there, for example, for a year, that your pay is the average of any other employee in your job classification for that same year. So in other words, you can't make less than minimum wage and everybody else is making $25 an hour. So he helped clarify some of that language. I thought there were improvements. Some of my colleagues who had voted twice for the bill um, found different reasons for not voting for it. Um, there was an intense amount of lobbying by these temp agencies because there's a lot of money at stake. Um, so I'm very hopeful that as we educate colleagues a little bit more that they'll come on board. Well, good luck, Senator. It clearly protects a lot of voters in my city. So good luck. Uh, you know, can you talk? I got to tell you, though, because you do, we do this all the time. We talk about how people go to work just like our families do. Right. And a lot of folks look at this and I will tell you, don't see it as protections. They see these folks sometimes as, you know, not understanding that they're just chasing the American dream, just like the Bulwages and the Crines and their families did years ago. And that's what we're talking about. Folks having a real chance, at the American dream. That's all. Senator, can we uh, move into the anchor program, which is another key issue that affects many New Jerseyans that was in the state budget uh, Talk to us, especially your office. I'm sure you're getting a lot of calls on the anchor program. And what are you advising our constituents? Sure. Um, and by the way, I would encourage constituents, anybody listening here, Chris, 908-624-0880 is our office number. Uh, we also have an office on, uh, on in, in Elizabeth as well. 908-624-0880 will help folks fill out uh, their anchor program rebate. And here's, what's, here's what it is. You are essentially eligible assuming you make $250,000 or less for a significant property tax rebate from the state of New Jersey, whether you are a renter or an owner. So you need to understand that sometimes renters uh, don't think that they're eligible. They are absolutely eligible for this program. I'm talking about getting back between $1,100 and $1,500 um, back. It'll be available in the first quarter of next year. Those rebate forms have begun to be mailed out. And what happens is, is folks get a form, it gives them a PIN number, they're supposed to go to the to the D Division of Taxation's website, which I have, but it's complex. Um, so I would encourage folks, if you see it on your rebate form, to go ahead and fill it out, fill it out promptly. If you have a question or you're not certain, anything from language barrier to the rest, 908-624-0880, we're there for assistance. And or if you just are concerned or, or, or not, quite comfortable filling it out, stop in one of our offices and we'll be happy to help. Senator, tell our viewers whether it's a direct check or is it a credit on taxes? It's a credit. It's a credit on? Yes. It's a credit to your taxes. It's a credit to your bill. So it's you have a choice between if you're a renter, you credit on your income tax. And if you're a uh, property tax owner, it's a credit to your property tax. Taxes. That's the way I understand it. Yes. Thank you, Senator. Because... Um, I think a lot of people need to understand that so they can uh, fill this form out because it's clearly helpful to many, many people in our city. Real money, real money for folks that have earned that money and they should understand this is a chance to get some back. And how do they, how do they apply if they don't get that card, they lose the card 
what what do they do? Literally, you know, it's a complex system on the division. It's New Jersey Division of Taxation. It's right on the front page of it on the website. And I do have the website. That said, I would always encourage folks just to reach out to us. We'd be happy to navigate that for them. Senator, tell us about affordability in New Jersey. That comes up in no, probably town hall meetings, comes up in the state budget process. Uh, what are your efforts and the efforts of the legislature in order to make New Jersey more affordable? You know, uh, we just talked about one, the significant uh, rebate package, which is more than $2 billion, I think is, uh, is a big deal in terms of being able to help folks with some of that affordability. But we've got a lot more to do. We've got to make, um, you're a leader in this, uh, looking for ways for housing to become more affordable for folks. And the availability of that housing has been an ongoing struggle, not only in the city of Elizabeth, but all around this state, as you know. Um, I've just generated something that creates a, a direct percentage of affordable housing, period, whether you're there or not. Um, and you know what this is, Chris. This is folks that you and I see in the diners, uh, folks that are working two jobs, folks that uh, take advantage of things like utility supports and heap and all the rest of it that need, uh, need a little extra assistance and they're more than entitled to if these are folks that work hard. Um, so those are some variety of different ways that we're trying to make the state more affordable. I think ultimately we're going to have to talk about consolidation of services and frankly, less layers of government, but I don't think we're there yet. We, well, we truly need a solution. That's always a battle with some of the smaller communities. They, they would lose an identity. As you know, Senator, it becomes a very difficult political issue. You know, the difference and, and it's always a tough discussion, but the reality of this thing is, is that, um, it just costs a lot to live here. And if we can figure out ways that it can cost less and preserve the quality of life, we really ought to deal with them. Senator, you've been instrumental in helping us through the state budget with the Elizabeth train station. As you know, uh, six, seven years ago, we were awarded over $70 million to construct and reconstruct the Elizabeth train station. It was delayed in the previous governor's uh, budget and didn't help at all. Uh, governor Murphy has moved it along, construction is going on, and as you know, there's always incidentals, and you were very helpful in the state budget this year in helping provide some of those additional resources, if you don't mind talking about it a little bit. Well, we were, and thank you again to, to your leadership. We were able to provide some funding that allows uh, for potentially demolition of buildings around the train station. I got a, look, I get it. This isn't a mutual love fest type of interview, but the reality of this is, is the train station with your vision is a game changer. And you've seen that with the investments just around the, just around the train station itself. The investment in the restaurant has certainly been something across the street you just talked about. Vinci is, is certainly, I think, a milestone development for the city of Elizabeth. Uh, the train station itself, the jewel it should be, um, it will finally be. We're looking at a schedule. I think we'll what out, what, another 18 months or so, Chris? Yeah, sometime at the end of 23, early 24, it should be full completed. Right. And I mean, it is going to be, in my view, one of the most exciting developments in the city of Elizabeth in years. It'll provide not only a gateway, uh, an easier, a custom um, gateway to be able to go into the city in one stop, as you know, so important these days, but the investments around it, the opportunity not only for economic development, for, for jobs, but for an enhanced quality of life for the residents of the city of Elizabeth and beyond. Uh, in my view, is just something truly special. The piece that I have to do with it is very little. We, you, you, you mentioned it a little bit. We had some bumps in the road. We were able to, for lack of a better way to put it, <laughs> grease the wheels. Um, with your shyness, we were able to do that. And, um, and as a result of being able to get that done, I think there's just so much optimism around this train station development, around what it is, and for mostly the commuters. Right. I mean, folks have had to put up with a, a, a train station that's been less than stellar just over the, the peer, just over time. That's all it is. Right. It just and this investment, I think, will show an exciting new opportunity for the city to showcase so much of its great availability uh, to many citizens around the state. And I'm really excited by it. Senator, we're going to close with my favorite topic, and that's urban enterprise zones. As you know, it's instrumental in a lot of the growth. And Elizabeth, you represent two cities. Uh, with an urban enterprise zone. Roselle has one as well. Uh, you've agreed to be on a panel in Atlantic City with me in November. Uh, thank you for your support, but appreciate everything you've done. Uh, legislative efforts uh, on UEZ. 
Certainly more needs to be done, right, Chris? We need to expand some of it. And we also need some funding and some rules definition that you've been fighting for. Um, we've got a lot of work still to do. Um, not everybody is the city. Not everybody can point to, to responsiveness and, um, and the opportunity to do more with UEZ funding that provides not only safety, but economic opportunity and the rest. So we've got a little bit more to do and we'll get it done. Senator, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. Appreciate your insight as well as your leadership for the 20th district. It's a great to have you in, in uh, Trenton because, you know, Trenton could be, well, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much Senator. Senator. Thanks a lot. For Senator Joe Cryan, I'm Mayor Chris Bolwage. We'll see you next week on another edition of Our City.